This is the History of Space Flight and Space Technology. I'm Andrew Chaikin. This is week four, Gemini and Vascod. Well, by the end of the Mercury program, actually even before that, <clears throat> NASA had made significant progress in preparing to fly the Apollo missions to the moon. Not not in the flying stage yet, but in the development stage, in the definition of what those missions would actually look like. And one of the most important decisions that was made before the uh, Mercury program ended, he actually was around the end of 1962, was what is known as the, the mode decision. And that was basically a question of what kind of mission plan would you use to try and land on the moon? Now, initially, there was uh, quite a bit of thought that you would just go directly to the moon with one big spaceship and land that spaceship on the moon and uh, then take off and come back to Earth. Now, that was called direct ascent. And it would require an enormous booster, which was referred to as NOVA. This was a Von Braun idea that would have massive amounts of thrust, uh, much more than what eventually became the Saturn V. Uh, and it was a bigger rocket than that. Uh, and um, it would have required, as you can see in the um, diagram at lower left, it would have required an enormous vehicle, 65 feet tall, to land on the moon. Um, in fact, there was even some question of how in the world would the astronauts even see the ground as they were coming down to make that landing when they were so high above the surface. How would you make sure that they had an accurate reading on their, uh, their altitude and their orientation and so forth? Well, there was another potential uh, plan called Earth Orbit Rendezvous, which again would use a very large spacecraft, um, but would make uh, use of two smaller boosters, which would link up in Earth orbit, potentially transfer fuel from one rocket to the other, so that uh, you would have enough fuel to get out to the moon at that point. This re requires some very difficult and, of course, yet untried techniques, but this was um, the mode that eventually was favored by von Braun and uh, Max Faget and others. But there was one other mode that was raised by a fellow in Virginia at the Langley Space Center named John Hubolt an engineer there at Langley, who had an idea for something called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And his idea, as you can see in the diagram, was that you would launch everything on one booster. You would have uh, two separate ships, one that would remain in orbit around the moon, while a second smaller vehicle would make the trip down to the moon's surface with two astronauts instead of three. And then part of it would lift off the moon and rendezvous with the mothership in orbit around the moon. Now let me go back to the previous slide and look at the uh, comparison between what is called the lunar excursion vehicle, which was um, the one of the mainstays of the lunar orbit rendezvous plan, Look at the comparison between that little lander, comparatively little, and the massive one required for direct ascent. So uh, despite some initial resistance to Hubolt's lunar orbit rendezvous plan, it was in fact, they did realize that that was in fact the best way to go. In fact, it was the only way to go and be doable before the end of the decade. They could do that with the Saturn V rocket that Von Braun had envisioned, and so um, 
this was the lander that was adopted for Apollo. Uh, initially, it was called the Lunar Excursion Module, uh, referred to informally as the Bug. And you can see on the right um, a kind of a, an illustration. Actually, this is from an old Viewmaster set that came out in the early 60s. Uh, the, uh, the upper half of the Bug lifting off after the astronauts have explored the moon and heading into lunar orbit to rejoin the command ship. And by having a smaller vehicle that you would take down to the surface of the moon, that meant that you didn't have to carry nearly as much fuel to get the whole shebang down to the lunar surface. You were saving weight and therefore fuel, and that was what made LOR so attractive. The thing that, of course, made it complex and, and somewhat daunting was the fact that you would have to learn the techniques of space rendezvous and do them around not the Earth, but the Moon. To do rendezvous in space was hard enough. Nobody had done that yet. But to think of doing it in orbit around the Moon was especially daunting. And yet, that turned out to be the plan that everyone realized was the best way to go. Well, so this was at the end of 1962. By that time, NASA was beginning to realize that they could not just go from Mercury to Apollo. You know, Mercury had a very limited set of objectives. The idea was to just get a guy up into space, into orbit, see if he could survive the trip, see if he could pilot the spacecraft in a limited way. Uh, Mercury, for example, did not have the ability to change its orbit in any way, the shape of its orbit or the tilt of its orbit, um, and so could never have carried out maneuvers that would require for a, a rendezvous in space. Uh, Mercury, of course, had a very limited uh, capacity for power and oxygen. Cooper's flight, uh, the, the day and a half flight that Cooper did, you know, was pretty much near the limit of what Mercury could have done. They were, there was some talk of a three-day Mercury flight, and Al Shepard was keen to fly that, but that did not get approval because NASA wanted to move on with the next steps. And that next step turned out to be a new project called Gemini. And Gemini had several major objectives. One was long-duration flight, and if you were going to go to the moon and back, you had to be in space for oh, you know, time periods of eight days or ten days or maybe even two weeks on some of the longer advanced landing missions. You had to be able to carry out space rendezvous, which had never been attempted. You had to be able to demonstrate that astronauts could leave their spacecraft and work outside in the vacuum of space, which was called extravehicular activity. You could... Uh, demonstrate that in Earth orbit, and then eventually you would have the confidence to try that on the surface of the Moon. And uh, finally, there was the um, necessity to perform a controlled reentry through the Earth's atmosphere, where you had some control over your flight path. Mercury did not have any control of like that. And uh, so all of these things, long duration, of course, you know, nobody knew what the uh, medical effects would be of a two-week space flight, but all those things, rendezvous, extravehicular activity, and controlled reentry, those became the necessary first steps to paving the way before we could even try a lunar flight. So Project Gemini was the, uh, the training ground, if you will, to demonstrate these techniques, and Gemini would be NASA's bridge to the moon.